Uh, my name is Balint Sieba. Thank you very much for, for coming this afternoon. I'd like to give you a bit of a whirlwind tour uh, of all the wonderful and interesting things you can do with software-defined radio. I, um, I'm an application specialist slash SDR evangelist for Edis Research. Um, we're based in, in the Bay Area in California, and um, we make some really cool software-defined radio equipment. Um, and I'd like to, to demonstrate some of it uh, for you here today. So just a quick uh, survey of the audience. Can you put your hand up if, if you've played with SDRs before? All right, great. Have any of you actually brought one of you one of them here with you today, like uh, you know, a usurp or an RTL dongle or anything like that. Because I'm transmitting stuff, I was hoping at least one person might be able to receive it and prove that I'm not, not faking it. Yeah, maybe one or two people? All right. Uh, well, if you wanted to actually set up your receiver and tune to 915 megahertz, then you might see something interesting there, and I'll, I'll show you uh, a little later on what, what that might be. Uh, in addition, um, I also have set up uh, a GSM network here. So if you get your unlocked phone and you scan for a network, you might see one that does not belong. Um, and that's what I was running the log for up here. Um, so if you just want to set your phone to scan, it's completely vanilla install, so it won't do anything nefarious to your telephone. Trust me. Um, Uh, but um, so I really love software-defined radio. Um, I love the fact that the radio spectrum is this is this incredible space that contains so many different sorts of signals, um, and you know I really love exploring and trying to reverse engineer those signals. Um, if you're congregating at the back, please please come in. Don't um, don't be afraid. There are some empty seats down the front here. Get comfy. <clears throat> Um, I was in Italy earlier this year. Um, you can see these are some uh, USRP B200s there I have. just wanted to get a nice photo. Um, I was, I was t teaching some labs to these, um, these participants, students from some developing nations. And I guess a pattern with me is wherever I go, some, for some reason, the police magically know I'm there and turn up. So in that case, it was the uh, Carabinieri. Uh, but before I sort of get into the meat of it, I want you to sort of transport yourself back um, 30 odd years. Who's heard of this, this space probe, ISEE3? A couple of people. All right. This was a space probe called the International Sun Earth Explorer. It was launched um, with two other probes, and it was launched in 1978. So just think back where you were and what you were doing around about August 12, 1978. Uh, it was one of the first space probes to be put um, into certain orbits, it, it was put into a heliocentric orbit around the Sun. And it was created to study the interaction between the solar wind and the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, it had some firsts. It was the first one in this halo orbit at this L1 Lagrange point. It's a special point between the Sun and the Earth where the um, gravitational forces are such that the probe will get drawn along as the Earth orbits the Sun. And it was also the first probe to pass through the tail of a comet. Um, every, every other nation had their probe on the way to, to visit um, a comet, and of course the US wanted to beat everybody, so they sent ISEE 3 out to meet this, this other one. And um, if you have a look here, this is sort of a, an illustration of the crazy orbital mechanics that they had designed for this, this probe to fly through. Initially it would go out to this L1 point orbit there, go out and meet the comet, and then at some point it was destined to return to our neck of the woods. So if you actually look at this on a video, um, you'll see that I've edited this and sped it up a little bit. But um, you can see that the, this is the Earth-Sun reference frame. So the Earth is always here at the center, speed it up. The moon's going around there. And then it was shot out to this L1 point. They do some lunar flybys. And then you can see it does the final flyby and then goes out with the uh, increased energy that it has into orbit around the, the Sun. Um, and it was an interesting space probe because it was spin stabilized, it had a lot of science instruments on board to collect scientific data, and it had some radio antennas so that it could uh, send this data back to Earth, along with all these thrusters so that its orbit um, and trajectory could be controlled. The telemetry would be sent back down, and this is apparently a screenshot of an old telemetry screen at the NASA um, Deep Space Network stations to give you an idea, this sort of encoded ASCII text meaning particular things about the propulsion system. 
Uh, and then as it went on its, its merry way around the sun, you can see there that um, it's sort of tracking the Earth and it's slowly catching up, slowly catching up until, what do you know, there's the Earth, it's getting closer and closer and closer. Um, and then you can call that more or less the present day if you look at the date in the bottom left hand, hand corner. So just, just keep in mind that throughout all this sort of SDR experimentation, I'll show you the space probe has slowly been, or actually pretty quickly been moving through the void. So I'd like to show you what you can do, have a bit of fun with restaurant pages, the radio data service, and it, specifically its traffic message channel, and uh, primary surveillance radar at, at airports, RFID systems, and I might come back to the space probe. So a lot of this is, is done with sort of open source software, and particularly this open source software defined radio framework or uh, DSP framework called GNU Radio. It's absolutely fantastic. Very vibrant community. Before I go on, this is actually a picture of the radio spectrum and a, and a particular frequency band. Any guess as to what this might be? Don't be shy, anyone. Except for maybe Matthew, because I reckon he already knows. One guess, come on, anyone, yes? Not quite, very close, that, that might be coming up. Someone else? I'll give you a clue, I already talked about it, maybe mobile, cellular, yes? No, not quite, um, but this is actually a whole bunch of different protocols on the, on the cellular band, so this is broader band CDMA, right in the middle there you have GSM, it's much narrower, 200 kilohertz channels, and then this, this very um, strong constant one here is probably the broadcast control channel from a cell, and then you can see the traffic just to the left of it. And what's interesting here is this FFT, this waterfall is sped up so, so quickly, you basically imagine time on the vertical and frequency on the horizontal, you can see these gaps there, and those gaps are the frequency correction bursts that the cell sends out so that your phone can discipline its internal oscillator to match uh, that of the cell. And so the cool thing is there are so many incredible tools now that you can run to really dive down and, and dig into these signals and reveal these little properties that you wouldn't normally see. Uh, so here's an example, did I accidentally... Uh, this is the other, other point that I wanted to make is with modern hardware and the incredible speed of, of computers nowadays, you can suck in a huge amount of data and that equates to an enormous amount of, amount of bandwidth. So this is actually 50 megahertz worth of bandwidth on this screen and um, th this is you know, an enormous amount compared to where we were even just a few years ago. We have high bandwidth interfaces like USB 3, 10 gigabit Ethernet, so you can pull in a, a huge amount. <clears throat> and this is, this is looking at um, that mobile uh, cellular band again. Uh, this is actually a video zooming in on what I was just talking about with the GSM um, band, and you can see here, these are the, the broadcast control channels, and every so often you can see these, these lines, and that line is a pure unmodulated sine wave that your phone uses to discipline its oscillator, and then you've got a bunch of traffic there, which is probably the downlink as the, the cell is sending data to the subscribers. Um, so, on the note of GSM, um, I've actually set up uh, a GSM base station right here sitting on this chair. This is running OpenBTS, it's an open source 2G implementation. Um, it's actually running on some hardware that we haven't publicly released yet, but it, it'll ha be happening soon. The entire base station is running on that tiny little, little board there. You feel free to come up um, at the end and, and have a quick look. But if you pull out your mobile phone and you go to manual network selection, you might see a, a network that you wouldn't expect in this part of the world. You can log on there. And has anybody tried this yet? Oh, great, a couple of people. And then did you get a text saying, welcome your IMSI is, is this? Yeah, cool. So what, what you can do now is text back on to 101 a four-digit telephone number that you want, okay? And that will assign you that number on the, on the mobile phone network. Now, I have my phone here, which is already on there, and if you want to make any special requests during the presentation, or you just want to send me a text, or you know, call me, whatever, um, completely against what you're normally advised to do with mobile phones during the presentation, then, uh, then feel free. My telephone number on here is two, oh. <laughs> oh, because I've got it up there, right? Yeah, me, hello, Who, who's this? Hello? Uh, ah, there we go, great, so it works. And, and so the cool thing is that, that this entire interaction is using normal consumer devices and, a, and an open source uh, imp implementation running on that tiny, tiny little thing there. So if I, now that we've got it working, this is actually asterisk, so it's a software-based um, 
routing, call routing system. It, it's it's um, a soft switch. So does somebody else want to call me again? Try, try, anybody? Uh, what's the name of the, the 2104? 2103. So when you actually dial, you can see that the call, this is in verbose logging mode. So when something happens, you'll see some activity there. Anyone? Oh, there we go. Did you see stuff happening? Yeah. So that's no, 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 no. So that's um, that's that's working nicely. And then here, uh, this is actually the verbose output of OpenBTS. So this is constantly sent, you know, logging the information that's being sent to and from the um, the mobile handsets, which is kind of cool. So that's that's working nicely. And you've got these other numbers here if you want to get the time or you want to get the echo test service or whatever. Then then you can dial those. And I'll leave that running so you can dial them. If you get bored of me blathering on, you can just just try that. What's that? Well, the hotline is 2103, that's me. Um, so this is actually looking at a different part of the spectrum now. This is the 400 megahertz band where you often have a lot of utilities and trunking control channels for um, fleet comms and so on. Uh, and what's interesting here is that this is, actually, uh, this is actually 100 megahertz worth of bandwidth, actually. So you can see here, there's an awful lot of activity, bursts going on and so on. So that's, that's actually pulling in twice the bandwidth now. And then if you really want to go crazy, you can even pull in 200 megahertz worth of bandwidth, really 120 megahertz of usable RF bandwidth. And if you want to kick it old school, then you can use this ASCII art DFT instead of using all the, you know, the beautiful fancy graphics. Um, you know, say if you're on a console and you're, you're SSHing in somewhere and you can't look at, at, at nice accelerated graphics, you can use you know, ASCII art. Um, and, and this is actually piping the data over 10 gigabit Ethernet to a, to a host from, um, this is the, uh, the USERP, which is the X300. Um, and then apart from pulling in data from one particular spot, there's also the notion of spectrum monitoring, but over a spatial area. So you see how spectrum usage can change as you move around. This is obviously a, on a much smaller scale, but this is Las Vegas, and I was driving around with one of these in the car. If you want to try and spot the car that I might be driving around in, then it might be the one with all the antennas coming out of the, the side of the roof. Those are the actual RF ones, and they're the GPS ones that log the position. So if you open the door, you can see you've got the radios there hooked up to my laptop. The radios themselves, actually, you can also put a GPS module in there. So as you are actually streaming the data in, you can uh, stamp with a location where the recording happened. And so you can build up these very wideband stitch spectrums, as I like to call it. This is looking at a very wide portion of the, the cell band again, a very wide portion of the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band. So as you drive around, you can collect these and see how the strengths change and so on and use it for planning and, and, and so on. So there's all sorts of things you can do. So the experiments that I want to show you um, were primarily done with one of these. Um, I've, got, I've got one happening here, and the other one's transmitting down there. Uh, it's a use of B200 or B210. It's um, USB 3.0, which is really cool because it's bus power. You don't need external power. You can sample up to 56 megahertz worth of bandwidth, which is huge. And you can tune anywhere from 70 megahertz to 60 gigahertz. So you have a huge frequency range to play with as well. So the first thing I want to look at is restaurant pages. Um, and you probably all know these. You go to a restaurant, you place your order, you're given the little, little disc that will light up when your order is ready. Then you go and collect it. So if you consider that the order and the collection rate from the kitchen should be around about the same, unless, of course, somehow they all happen to go off at the same time. Um, there are a number of different ways you can find the frequency out. You can actually just scan with one of these devices. You can look at the back of one of the pages, and often it's actually written there. Or you can look up on your local regulatory frequency um, database what, what frequency has been licensed to the system. So if you were to actually look at it on the spectrum, you'll see there. This is actually a page going out from the, from the kitchen to someone's pager, and it would have just lit, light, um, you know, lighted up the, the, the device. By the way, I forgot to say that um, apart from just making telephone calls on this on the system, you can, um, you can send texts as well. And I also forgot to mention, once you have registered a number, shout it out so that you know, people can text amongst yourselves. So you, and you, then you don't have to pay. It's free texting. How good is that? Um, so that's, that's that. And so if you were to actually look at these pages signals on a waterfall like this, it reveals the first step um, of, of some parameters that you need to demodulate the signal in its entirety. So the first thing you'll notice is that 
This is frequency shifting, where the, the frequency on the spectrum will change between two points, and that will indicate whether it's a, a 1 or a 0. And then you can use that to demodulate it and decode and get your raw 1s and zeros, and then try and make sense of it. But what you'll notice here is that there is no long strings of 1s or zeros. There are many, many transitions here, and that tells you something about the line encoding of this particular data. So that's, that's a, a very important clue. Um, in GNU Radio, you can create these things called flow graphs, which are basically, uh, at the highest level, using this graphical user, uh, graphical um, development environment where you can put blocks down and then connect them up. And then it's essentially sending the signal through a bunch of different blocks that perform different DSP operations on those blocks. From you know, filtering at the high level all the way down to sort of manipulating the raw ones and zeros. So in this particular graph, flow graph, I've put some blocks in there that will help with analyzing this page of signal. And the first step, or the, the second step after actually recording it, is that you do what's called channel selection. So here it's very obvious, this is the noise floor, and then we have a very, very strong page of signal that's shown up here. So we select that channel, we, and then we extract that, and move it to what's known as our baseband, so to the center of the dial essentially, so that we can then continue working on it. And this particular block you would use there, the frequency translating FIR filter. Once it's actually at the center of the dial, you can see how here it was off to the side on the spectrum, but now it's at zero. And then this is zoomed in. So this is looking at, this is, this is zoomed into this signal here. You can see that because it's frequency shifting and it's moving between two frequencies, you can see these two peaks. And then you determine what the deviation is. So how far out from zero they go. And then once you actually know that deviation, you can do this quadrature demodulation, which is like demodulating an FM signal, like a, you know, your broadcast FM or what have you, but this is a very simple version. And then once you've got your deviation, you get this very nice time domain plot where your deviation to one side or the other will be shown as one or negative one. And this is actually that, that, that raw signal there. And that's simply done with this quadrature demodulation block. The next step is then determining how quickly that data is moving through the system. The board rate, the symbol rate, we don't know that, we can, but we can measure it with some tricks. And if you hook up um, some blocks in a very simple fashion to do what's called cyclostationary analysis, then you can determine by doing a, a fast Fourier transform of the signal, uh, of a, but it's a little bit more complicated than that, but the last step is this fast Fourier transform, and you look at the peaks, and the first peak the largest peak there will tell you the board rate of your signal. So it's really cool. You can put your signal in and it'll give you a number as to how quickly the transitions are happening. And then it just prints it out there. So now we know the deviation, we know that it's frequency shifting, we know how quickly the bits are coming. And then what we can do is do clock recovery. And this takes our original signal and changes it into raw ones and zeros. And you can see them here. This is actually deviating between 1 and negative 1, and we can slice this. So anything above the 0 we'll call a 1, anything below the 0 line, the center line, we'll call a, 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 a 0 bit. And you can tell if it's working because when you go from this line plot to the dot plot, you can see the blue, there's this great separation on either side of the center line. Does everyone, everyone see that? So if you've got this good separation, it means that your board rate is calculated correctly and the recovery algorithm is actually sampling your signal at the right time. So this is really good. And then I was lying a little bit before the flow graph uh, is a little bit more complicated. You can see I've got disable blocks there. It's really nice for rapidly prototyping stuff. I'm, I'm absolutely terrible in making clean flow graphs, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, but that's, that's a sort of a hint of what, what mine tend to look like. Um, then once you've actually got those raw ones and zeros out of the system, it's try, time to actually interpret them and extract some information that we can understand. This is what it looks like originally. And remember how I was saying there are lots of transitions? Uh, it helps clock recovery at the receiver. And it looks like it might be Manchester encoded. So if we turn on Manchester encoding, which means that every pair of bits will actually equate to a data bit. So if it's zero, 01, then that'll turn into a zero. If it's a one zero, then that'll turn into a one. It's a way of having these transitions uh, turn into basically half a number of bits. So if you do that, then you end up with half the number of bits. 
but then it looks like we have some proper data here because we have long sequences of zeros, for example. And it looks like at the beginning we have these um, transitions again that also helps as a synchronization byte. So when a receiver is listening, it listens for a known pattern. And when it hears that known pattern, it thinks, oh, okay, there's actually a packet happening here. I'm going to listen for the rest of it. Um, and we can test whether it's Manchester by moving all of the bits down by one. And if the Manchester uh, transitions don't happen per the spec, then you get these violations, as they're called, and they're highlighted in red. So it's, a, it's basically a quick way of verifying that, that we have the, um, the line encoding down pat. If you look at it correctly, then you can compare multiple transmissions and then highlight in green the differences between the bits. So we're going to page one person with one pager ID and we're going to page someone else with a different ID. And we might be able to then have a clue as to where that ID is encoded in our mystery packet. Because remember, this is all going completely blind. We have no idea how the protocol works. So once you actually get a page like this one, then it becomes clear that 12 is encoded in that byte. The last byte there is some checksum. You, I went through a whole bunch of CRC um, algorithms. None of them matched. Turned out to be a really simple sum over the entire packet mod 255. And it matched. So that's the decoding process. What about making an encoder? Well, you can construct the packet. You've got your preamble for the synchronization. You've got this magic header. You've got the pager number and the checksum. And then you do some other things in that flow graph to prepare it so that it will be ready to transmit out of these radios. This is what the flow graph for that actually looks like. You generate your pager packet in there, you interpolate, um, then you frequency modulate it, then you resample for the USRP, and then you send it out. So when you actually send it, I'm going to page there, page ID 0, and you can see a very similar waveform to the one that we received, and then it, it goes out into the spectrum there. Um, if, this is, if you actually look at it in the same way, then this looks remarkably like the signal that we received. So this is a hint, well, maybe things are working. Uh, and this is, was a little test that I did. I went there one morning when I thought I had the, the program working nicely. Put the number in. And there you go. Uh, now, Matt Edis founded Edis Research. That's my boss. He's sitting right there. I didn't tell anybody that I had the system working. And what I did is I got um, I set it up on my laptop and I went in because I pretended that I had to make a phone call. But I actually had ad hoc Wi-Fi network running between my laptop and my phone and an XMLR PC client on my phone so I could control the paging system. So I put in his pager number and he thought his food was ready. So he went up to the kitchen and mayhem. The poor girl, they didn't know what was going on. I have officially been trolled. So he was officially trolled. Um, and, and I added this little feature here, which is the slider. So, you know, I didn't actually ever use this, but if you were to click and then you held down the right arrow on your keyboard, it would go through every single pager combination. And you can imagine how the kitchen would respond to that. So that's, that's one system that was reverse engineered from scratch. There's another system that uses the old POCSAG pager system that was used with the old beepers. And you can very easily get into that um, using GR POCSAG. There are a lot of out-of-tree modules available for GNU Radio. So you download GNU Radio, and then you can download the source code to these out-of-tree modules, compile them in, and then gain access to additional functionality. And in this case, this one will decode this POCSAG protocol. Um, and uh, flow, the flow graph there, um, but essentially GR POCSAG gives you this POCSAG decoder. And that's an example of the output in the console. So these are all the frames that come out um, as it's listening over the air at this other restaurant. And if we look, were to look at one particular packet, you've got a lot of idle frames, you've got the address, and you've got this data that encodes what the pager should actually do. In this case, it'll just light up and say that your food is ready. Um, and the address is encoded in, in here. Um, what's interesting about POCSAG is that the slot in which your address actually fits uh, is very important because those last three bits are actually the slot number divided by two. So this is very clever because POCSAG, you have the pager, it's running on a battery, and if it hears the sync word, then the radio address encoded in your 
own unit will actually tell you what address you're in. So you know the last three bits and therefore you know what slot you expect your data to be in. So the radio can actually t remain off for all of the other slots because your data can't possibly be in there. It's a really nice little power saving trick. But in this case, um, you use that then to create your own pager frame so that you put the data in the correct slot for the pager that you want to actually address. You put in the idols, you put in the action, and then you apply the error correcting code to each of the slots per the spec. And so you can get 46, like you can see it going out there. I went to lunch with my colleague. goes off. To and test out we'll this different system. 39, and then we'll do 56, and then we'll do 83. I think you might be able to hear them going And then 82, and 78. Yeah, little, little automated voices, the page is saying, your order is ready. What's the point? What's the point? <laughs> and that's, that's my dear colleague. He, he said, what's what the point? 56? What about 56? And that's just stuck at the office. So that's the in-joke. Whenever something goes wrong or we don't know what's happening at the office, we just throw our hands up and say, what's the point? Um, and then th the third system is Zigbee, which is a 2.4 gigahertz um, protocol. This page is really interesting because it, the, it has an RFID reader built into the pager. So when you sit down at your table, the table has RFID tags stuck on underneath and it will read the ID of your table and transmit that back to the kitchen. So instead of you having to go and pick up your order, they know where you're sitting and they will bring out the order to you. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but this is using the standard Zigbee protocol and you can actually decode it out of the box with this out of tree module GRI triple eight oh two fifteen four. Um, and it's a very elegant, um, el elegantly implemented uh, piece of piece of out of tree module software. You can hook up a very simple flow graph like this and then you can, this is, this is actually at the restaurant with the, the B200 there listening to these two pages. You can simply run it. You can see a packet coming out here, packet data being dumped on the console. And you can also hook it up to Wireshark, which has all the dissectors in there already. And then if you look carefully, you can see the numbers there. They match up to the bytes in the packets. And I went back to the kitchen to look at their screen to figure out what table ID I was sitting at and the table IDs are in there as well. So that one's done too. If you want to take a pager hostage, it usually listens for the beacon from the system. If you wanted to take one hostage, you could broadcast your own beacon and then take a hostage. So that's pages. The next thing I'd like to talk about is um, the traffic message channel on FM. If you actually look at the FM broadcast band, this is zooming right into a couple of different stations. And what's so cool is that you can zoom right in there and I think in the strongest one there, somebody's actually talking. So you can actually see the FM deviation, the frequency deviation based upon uh, the speech. You know, somebody's talking to a microphone and it's, it's modulating this, uh, this signal there. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool to, to look in that detail. But RDS, you probably know um, from a radio receiver, you get the station name, the song title, and so on. Um, it's usually on most broadcast FM stations. It's actually transmitted, that information transmitted on a digital subcarrier that you cannot hear uh, with this odd board rate, oops, um, that you can see there. And you can decode this again with GNU Radio pretty much out of the box once you set up, compile, and install GRRDS. So in San Francisco, there's this tower called Sutro Tower. It has a whole bunch of FM radio stations transmitting out of there. And I thought it might be interesting to, to listen to one of them and run GRRDS. And so you can see here, it's just plugged in listening. You've got your FM baseband here. This is the radio station. You can see on the left-hand side all of the RDS information scrolling in the console, and then the panel will give you that decoded information like the song name, the genre, and so on. And if you look at the subcarriers, you've got the mono channel, the FM pilot tone, the stereo difference channel so that you can listen to the stereo audio again, and then this one here is the um, BPSK RDS subcarrier that actually conveys all this digital information. So what's interesting about it is that Aside from receiving, GRRDS also allows you to transmit. So this isn't a common station name. This is just one that I happen to make up. Um, and then this is the transmitter again in GNU Radio. Here you can see a spectrum that looks very much like what we received, but in this case the software is creating it. So that was, that's kind of cool. But one interesting thing is that, that you don't often see unless you have a dedicated navigation system is the traffic message channel. So it's really neat because it will broadcast information about the state of the roads in your area. So there might be things like traffic congestion, accidents, and so on. It will send out an event code, a location code, and a duration. 
and so you can have these sorts of events. And if you have a nav system in your car, then it will actually you know, put icons on the map to tell you where road work is, or highlight uh, elements of roadways where there's congestion, so you know, you know what roads to avoid, or if you're using the navigation system, it might calculate a more optimal path. And so if you actually run it, and you filter out all the um, traffic messages, you can see here it's talking about uh, congestion, uh, actually some weather reports, um, average speeds along particular roadways so that your nav system can highlight things appropriately. Uh, but what's interesting is that, at least in certain areas of the world, not so much Europe, which was interesting, the location codes are encrypted. And there are 16-bit code with 16-bit keys. And one key out of a pool of 31, which are encoded and, and placed in the hardware, are chosen randomly each day. And that key ID is broadcast regularly throughout that day. So your receiver knows which key to use. And so if you look at the actual decoded information, I wrote some additional code to process this. It prints out the key ID there. And then what I had noticed was interesting is that it actually sends out these temperature uh, reports. So I thought, well, you know, if, um, if I'm not going to be able to get any useful location data because it's encrypted and so on, maybe I can just plot the temperatures from, from a couple of places around the barrier and see, see what the temperature looks like throughout the course of a day because I like visualizing things. But I noticed that um, the, the actual temperature values didn't change throughout the course of a day. I thought, hmm, that's, that's pretty strange. So I noticed this pattern. And the pattern was that there are always three unique temperature reports. And when you always had the same, uh, you know, on one particular day, they would always cycle through the same encrypted location and the same fake temperature value. And then the next day, you might have a, you know, obviously a different key, so you get a different location code, but the fake temperature values would still be the same. And then maybe a week later, they would change, but you would have the same key ID that you had maybe a week ago, and so the encrypted location codes would be the same, but the, um, the event IDs would be different. So you could, I could see this sort of pattern coming together, and I thought, well, maybe, maybe you can exploit that. So that's what I was just talking about. Once you actually look at it, you can see there that the software that will then pull, look at the messages and then pull out those three unique um, pairs of, of data. And so I won't dwell on this too much, but just to give you a, a, give you a taste, if you imagine time going across from left to right, you have these three unknown locations that are being encrypted. And then you have, on the first day there, you have key number one, and this is in this group where your, uh, your event codes are the same. So what's broadcast over the air are, are the elements of these cells. So you encrypt the location, and then you have this, um, this grouping. And then you can follow that from day to day within the one group period where your key ID will change and your encrypted location will change, but the fake temperature report stays the same. And then you correlate that with the next group, as I was saying, when the key ID will come back to what you knew before, but the um, bless you, but the um, the location might be different, and so on. So you basically you build up this information over the long period of time. So I would I would take down notes about this every day for many many weeks. 16 bits is very short. Um, you could say that well you can do an exhaustive search. You can't just do an exhaustive search because due to the nature of the encryption algorithm, you can get a hell of a lot of um, results. So that doesn't really help you. You need to use some additional information, which is why I went through this process. Um, so you can also use singular events that um, can be correlated from some trusted source. When I say singular events, I think I'm talking about things that don't happen very often. Congestion happens everywhere. You don't often have an object on the road. And you can use this and then look at the RDS output and say, aha, I see this mapping from, from encrypted location to the, this event. I can use this as a, as a known data point. Um, and you can use that to speed up your search process. So once you have all your input data, you can arrange it into this sort of table, where across the top you have these three unknown plain text codes. You have all of your key IDs that you've collected from every day. You have your pairs, where you have your um, encrypted location code. And then the algorithm essentially says, all right, I'm going to generate every single possible key and every single possible plain text location code for this one using these two pairs. And then I'm going to look at the other two on that particular day using that key, and I'm going to start filtering down invalid entries where you have your possible key, 
you have your possible um, plain text codes and anything that doesn't match up here I'm going to remove from the pool. And then you repeat that over all the other keys. And essentially, if you look at it this way, you have your possible pool of location, known location codes, possible pool of keys. You go through this iterative algorithm and you cut everything down and then you end up with something like this, where some of, you know, with a relatively, um, you know, not a huge amount of information collected over a course of weeks, you essentially end up recovering keys. Um, and what's also interesting is that even though on some, uh, many, obviously many of the encryption IDs haven't recovered all the, you know, just this one single key, there are possible multiple matches. Due to the nature of the encryption algorithm, you can still recover one matching uh, plain text location code um, given the encrypted one. So I thought, I thought that was an interesting result. Um, the only problem is that it kind of re relies on you expediting the search process using these singular events. Unfortunately, the things like vehicle fires and flooding. So I just hope you know everybody was okay. Um, yes, question. Yes. Yes. We can talk about that offline. Uh, and I should have said, if you have any questions at any stage, feel free to ask. Or if um, you, know, you don't want to put your hand up, then you can also call me. You, you, you've got my number. Um, all right, so moving on then, aviation radar. If you've been in an airport, you've probably seen one of these big radars spinning there. This is the primary surveillance radar, and then you have this smaller antenna on the top. That's the secondary surveillance radar. So the primary works in the traditional manner. It sends out a very strong pulse, and then it listens to echoes off reflecting objects like planes. And the secondary system sends out an interrogation and re relies on the aircraft having, having a transponder that will receive that interrogation and actively transmit back a response. So the first one, it, the target can be passive. The second one, the target has to be active. And the way it works with the primary system is that it sends out a very strong pulse called the bang. And then that will hopefully be returned off uh, ob metallic objects like planes because they have a radar cross-section. And they will reflect some of that energy, although very, very weak, which is why the antenna is so large. Uh, and then it will process that as it spins and build up this radar scope. Um, so the secondary system, who's heard of ADSB and, and tracking planes and all that kind of thing? Yeah. So this was actually the first project that I did with um, Software Defined Radio many years ago now. ADSB is neat because it actually has a radio on board that transmits the aircraft's position, heading, altitude, vertical rate, flight ID, score code, and, and other information too. And in addition to just ADSB, a typical 747 has 31 radios, which is a hell of a lot. And it makes somebody like me very excited. <laughs> so if you, next time you go traveling and you're just waiting to board the plane, have a look at the plane and the gate next to you and try and spot some of the, these antennas, quite a few of them on the top. Um, there's the HF1 in the tail, and you've got a number of them underneath the aircraft as well. Uh, now, what's interesting about Mode S and ADSB is that it's transmitting data over the air, but it uses Manchester encoding like that original pager system. So you can see here, here it's called chips. You can have an early chip and a late chip, but essentially it's the same sort of encoding. And that translates to a one or a zero. Once you put that through a decoder, this is um, the one that I made running in real time. These are packets um, being received from all sorts of aircraft all over the, all over the, the place. Um, you can then plot that spatially. This is a, a program I wrote a while back excuse me, called the Aviation Mapper. This is uh, flights throughout the Bay Area. Um, sometimes transponders can be broken and send bad information, which is why you see that craft on the right. And we'll get the beautiful rainbow effect in a minute from another plane that has a bad transponder. Wait for it. There we go. Um, but they're all ra la landing at San Francisco Airport in Oakland and uh, San Jose. And what's cool is that you can build up sort of the map of the flight trails over time. And the color coding there is altitude. So as they come in, you can see they change color. Um, this is actually a close-up of the runways at San Francisco Airport. Um, I went there one night with a, a B-210 and set the system up. Here you can see two planes coming in on a parallel landing. They're green there, they're the actual planes in real life, and they will turn red when the nose gear touches the tarmac. So that's when it's actually touched down. The top one has, the bottom one will just turn red now. So that's when it actually has hit the ground. And you can see them then taxiing back to the terminal. Uh, the other one is actually a takeoff. I, I think this was a, 
I can't read it, but I think it's version America taking off there. I've sped it up a little bit, obviously. And you can see that it's red because it's on the tarmac, but when the nose uh, lifts up, you'll see it turn green. It's just um, on the takeoff roll there, speeding up. And it's so cool because you can watch it and you can see the incredible velocity to which um, the plane will accelerate there. It's just taking off there. And you can see it's following a flight path that it was taken by a plane uh, just previously to that. But look out in the, in the top right corner. You can see it ascending there, the altitude's going up. Oh no, is there somebody coming along? But luckily, they're at 42,000 feet. Uh, and the other one's at 2,400 feet. So there's a bit of vertical separation there. Uh, and the cool thing is you get position and you get altitude. So wouldn't it be cool if you could plot it in real time over the web through Google Earth? Um, and that's that same plane there taking off in, in 3D. Um, this was a system that I set up in Sydney before I moved to America. Um, and I left it there. And you can go on the website and, and it will show you the entirety of Sydney airspace. And then apart from that, wouldn't it be cool if in 3D you could have a virtual cockpit view? So you, you could be in the pilot seat as if you were taking off. Uh, so that's the same plane there as it takes off into the sky and then swings around north um, to head up the bay. And I think you might be able to see another plane coming in there to Oakland at some point. There's one up there. Yeah, that's San Francisco in there. Um, Treasure Island, so on. So this is actually coming into land, um, coming back from Blacksburg, Virginia, landing at San Francisco Airport, um, lining up for the runway. There we go. Boom. And then waiting at the holding point, coming around. And Google Earth did something really weird. It looks like a big fire ripped through San Francisco Airport, and then you're just left with the burnt out fuselages of planes. Um, and then this was actually now Sydney. So what's interesting is you have ADS-B, but you've also got a different system called ACARS, which is like text messaging for aircraft. And those ACARS messages are shown with those balloons. So every time a plane has a message transmitted to it or transmits a message back, it shows you spatially where that happened with the balloon. And those things might be engine performance reports, flight plans, um, other sort of data, and most of it's plain text and human readable. So you can build up these amazing maps of all of the ACARS messages that are sent. And then when some flight plan information is sent out, it will actually have all the waypoints in the system and then plot with these white lines the flight path that that plane is going to take. Um, this is actually close up now on Sydney Airport. You, a lot of ACARS messages are sent um, during takeoff and landing. So you can see there all these little dots will form as planes um, take off and taxi and, and so on. Uh, and then I added this little Easter egg. I always saw errors about the failure of toilets on aircraft. So whenever there's a fault with a, with a lavatory, then you get, this, um, you get this little picture instead of just the dot. That was the little Easter egg there. Um, and then these are actually flight plans that are sent for planes that are going to Western Australia and all the way up into Asia. Um, so that, that's a system where the plane is sending out all this info. Yes, question. It's not encrypted, no, it's completely open. Yeah, and this has been discussed at length at many conferences for, it seems like eternity. But, I mean, it's fun because you can receive it. Just whatever you do, do not transmit, otherwise you'll be locked away for a very long time. Because, um, I mean, you know, you're, you, this is a safety critical thing, obviously. Um, but primary surveillance radar, it's a completely passive system. So near where I live and work in the Bay Area, there is actually this... ASR-9, primary surveillance radar, which is common throughout the world, near um, Moffett Field Air Force Base. And that's what it looks like in Google um, Earth. And the picture of the ground, I'm sure you recognize it. You've seen them before. Um, so I thought I'd take a, a B-200 up there and try and receive the signal to see what it actually looked like. So you can see here as the radar rotates, um, this left-hand time domain scope is showing you the magnitude of the signal coming back into the radio. And the big bang there is seen on the very left-hand side. And then this is sort of a plot, um, a much slower plot of the bangs as they're sent out because they're sent out at very high frequency. And so you can see every time it points at, at, to the camera, I'll play, just play that bit one more time, you can see this massive increase in amplitude here. I don't know if you just saw that. It'll come around again, wait for it. There we go. And what, what caught my eye is that apart from the bang, you see how there are other little peaks popping up here? I thought, well, they're actually returns off stuff. They're very close in, so it's just ground clutter. But let's take a closer look. So 
Remember, I showed you this before. This was actually the signal that I, I uh, was able to record. So you've got the bang there, and then you seem to have these weaker returns. It's beautiful up there if you're ever in the Bay Area and you want to hang out one evening, feel free to tweet me or whatever kids do these days on social media, and, um, and you can head up there. It's quite nice in the evening. I went up there with some friends of mine. We took all this gear up to try and record the signal. Um, this is actually using that 10 gigabit um, interface. So I have my laptop with Thunderbolt and um, it's using that X300. Unfortunately, the Thunderbolt connector on my laptop failed, so my friend there is basically sacrificing his hand trying to push the connector and hold it in there to maintain the link, because you know it, you have to have it there from boot, otherwise your device drops off the PCI Express bus. Um, and this is a, a sort of nice homage back to the early days. This is my friend back in Australia. We're above Sydney Airport receiving the ADS-B stuff. Um, so as you can see, uh, we don't like to travel light. Um, but once you actually record the signal, I wrote a little bit of software to process the signal. Um, I won't go through the details there, but these are histograms of the magnitude. So you select some, some parameters to look at the strong signals and then determine the, the pulse repetition rate, the length of the pulses. This is actually a bang here, many, many bangs that are synchronized now and overlaid on top of one another. And you can see some interesting stuff happening after that in time. And then this radar is interesting because it fires off the bangs at two different rates. It's called a dual PRF, dual pulse repetition frequency radar. And you can see those patterns very clearly there. So you program that in as well with this histogram. These are, gives you, give you clues as to the, P, to the two PRFs. One's, I think, 945 hertz, and the other one's 1,250 hertz. Um, and then once you program all these parameters in there, you iteratively build it up, and then you start tracking the amplitude. So every time you have one of these big peaks, that's when the radar has rotated and is pointing at you, which is why the signal is so strong. So you have, what, six revolutions of the radar, seven revolutions of the radar in this capture. And by the way, this is capturing on this, um, on, on this B210 at 50 mega samples per second over USB 3 into RAM disk. So on my laptop, I think I had eight gigs of RAM. It would fill up in less than 30 seconds. So just to give you an idea about the sheer um, you know, torrent of data that's coming in there. So if you actually look at these pulses in the time domain synchronized over time, the software has now synchronized to the revolution and the, and the transmission rate of the radar, you get this. The bang there is at the beginning, and then you have these um, reflections coming back. So once you plot that then in a raster plot, here time is going on the vertical axis, and each scan line is triggered by a bang from the radar. So every time the software Here's the bang, it will start recording for the length of this scan line and then plot the energy that comes back, that it hears back from any of the returns. So what's interesting is that you can see these, these patterns start to form. And I was thinking, well, you know, what's, what's this curved pattern here? And there's this dot out there. What could that possibly be? Well, if you unwrap it and actually put it on the map where the radar is at the center and you align things appropriately, then you can see that it actually fits with real physical features in the Bay Area. So I couldn't, ha I couldn't figure out what these dots were. And then I looked at the map, and as it turns out, there are power pylons that crisscross all over the Bay Area, and they were actually reflecting the radar energy back into the radio. And you can see that the, these points line up perfectly where the pylons actually are. The other hot spots here are sort of larger buildings around the Bay Area. And then further out, you can see we have two bridges there, and those bridges are also reflecting some energy. So this is great. It's, it's kind of working. And the other thing to keep in mind is that this entire thing, I'm just receiving with a whip antenna like this, hooked up to the board. This is not a special high-gain antenna or, or anything like that. And the next step is obviously to get a better antenna. Um, but if you were to plot out six of the revolutions, what you can do is you can take the first one, put that into an image as the red channel, take one of the middle ones, put it in as the green channel, take the last one, put it in as the blue channel. And so you would get this black and white picture. And if everything is stationary, it will come out as white. But if something's moving, any guesses to what you'll see? What? Colors, right. So there's no color in this one. But if you look at this one, there's some color there. You have this RGB triplet. I thought, oh, wow, something's actually moved. Uh, and in this one, again, I found something else. It was a weaker return because it's further out, but something moved. If you unwrap it onto the map, um, then it's a little bit difficult to see there, but it's just at the edge of the bay, 
and it was on a road, and I think, it, judging from the speed, you know, you can calculate that roughly from the rotation rate and so on, I think it was a large truck, because if a large truck was moving, it's got quite a large radar cross-section on the side, and it would have reflected some of the energy at that rate. Obviously, I would like to pick up airplanes taking off from San Jose Airport, but without a really good directional antenna pointing in that direction, it's probably unlikely I'll be able to pick it up with a little whip antenna. But that's the next stage of the project. Um, apart from just using primary radar to do this sort of your own, create your own virtual passive radar system, you can also use other very powerful signals. And just to give you a quick taste, this is something new that I'm working on. This is using ATSC, which is America's version of DVB-T. So this is the, the American digital TV system. If you think about it, Digital TV transmitters are everywhere, and they transmit very powerful signals. So this is what the spectrum looks like. And if you try and find returns off particular objects, you might be able to use it as a bit of a radar system. And this has been done before with DVB-T and other systems, but I'm just having a go. Um, this is the pseudo-noise PN code that's actually embedded in the signal that happens at regular intervals to demarcate the field sync so that a receiver can synchronize the signal. Um, and it happens at regular intervals, as you can see there, with these correlation peaks. If you then synchronize, and you can see you get this great correlation peak for that particular PN sequence in your received signal. If you plot that over time, then you get this, again, this beautiful peak. Uh, and then this is the sort of view in Google Earth from my friend's place. And we, we want to test this out for multipath, which is basically where you have a receiver and you have different sort of land features that will reflect the same signal but over a slightly different distance. So at the receiver, you will hear the same signal arrive at slightly different points in time. And the receiver has to filter then and, f and listen to only one signal. So there's a hill here, and there's also a hill further out there, which means that when the signal's coming from the transmitter further back behind us, it's going to hit this hill first, come back, and then this signal from the reflected off the hill in the, in the distance will arrive a little bit later. So people talk about multipath, but I thought this was a really good visualization of it. So you can see here, my friend is actually holding the antenna and pointing it at the first hill and then slowly moving it around to the other hill with time going down here. So you can see the first um, correlation peak is really strong because he's looking at, at the closer hill. And then as he turns around, the signal becomes stronger from the hill in the distance, which is this one that becomes lighter there. But it's offset in time. So if this is like T0 in the middle, then this is the delayed signal because the time is going along the bottom there. And then I thought, well, what happens if you actually, instead of you know, using the hills, you sit in the car and you drive from San Francisco down into the South Bay and record the, the spectrum every so often. You know, you'll have hills and whatever moving because you're essentially moving yourself. You're flipping the problem around. And I think this is some very initial analysis. But instead of being a straight line here, some of them are curved ever so slightly because I'm moving. And so the distance, um, the, the, the total distance the signal takes as it's reflecting off things will change. So it's just a bit of initial work there. Um, now, let me look at the time. I might sort of skip this bit a, a little bit so for the sake of time. But um, you've got these fast track tags and so on. These are used. For electronic um, toll booths, as you're driving around, you know you don't have to pay. You just go through the booth, and it reads your account off here, and then subtracts money from your account. Uh, this is a completely unencrypted system, and it uses interrogation signal at 900 megahertz and backscatter modulation. It, backscatter means that the tag itself does not transmit a signal back. It simply changes the load on the antenna inside the device and the radar cross-section of your tag will change. So the reader is constantly sending a signal, and then your, your uh, tag will, will actually receive that interrogation, change the antenna load, and then the receiver will actually detect that subtle change in your tag and decode the data from that. It's really cool. And it means that the receiver in the, in the tag and the transmitter can be really simple. It just has a one long life battery inside it. Um, so I was curious as to what these antennas were on, for on, on these power poles. Turned out it was this system. So I took my Yagi antenna, recorded the signal in the car, looked very inconspicuous as I was pointing it at the toll booths on the Golden Gate Bridge, trying to um, sample the signal there. And then this is, again, what you get. You get your wake-up signal that wakes the tag up, the preamble, the actual payload that says, hey, what's your ID? Very much like the Manchester encoded system in Modes, funnily enough.
And then you have this backscatter carrier, which is just a single unmodulated carrier that will hit the device, have it, it, it uh, modulated, and then the return will be detected by the original reader. Uh, I'll skip that. But um, essentially, this is the GNU radio flow graph. You can see there um, the backscatter carrier there is unmodulated, but when I put my tag in the radio, then suddenly it becomes modulated and the, and the system will read the ID out. Um, and so if you look at it in the video, you can see just as a simple test through a windshield, put the tag behind there, got the antenna, and as soon as you hold it up there, and then it, it picks up the tag ID. And, and this is, you know, you can, you can put one on an overpass and then read everybody's tags as they drive um, underneath. Uh, or you could follow people around, or you could spoof the tag and pretend to be somebody else. Um, this is the flow graph. Um, another thing you can do is, is use um, similar system to look at wireless um, entry you know, uh, uh, for um, vehicles this is the Toyota Prius. Um, the Prius is constantly broadcasting a challenge and when the owner has their remote control it picks up this challenge and then broadcasts something back over VHF that unlocks the car. It's a really neat system. But you can use SDR then to actually look at the protocol and look at the actual raw, raw bits and then do some security analysis if you feel that way inclined. Uh, this was cool though because the radio was a dual channel radio, so it's recording the low frequency challenge from the car and the response from the, the remote control at the same time. And so when you collect the data together like that, then you can actually look at them together and see if there's any interesting patterns in the timing. Uh, and then I also looked at the secure um, badge system that we have in the building. And again, it's a similar system to the fast track tag. There's the reader, um, it sends out a, a challenge and then the, the badge has this backscatter thing as well, and then it responds, and then you can do some analysis on that too if you wanted to. So just to conclude then, um, remember we had that lonely space probe flying through space, it had completed its mission, NASA had thrown out all of the equipment that it had used to communicate with it because of funding and the mission was over, so it was headed on its way back to Earth, and I think somebody asked, you know, when I asked you what the spectrum was, somebody said the telemetry, who was that? Yeah, yeah, so there's the telemetry. That's actually the telemetry from the, the, from the space probe. Um, and so an unlikely mob got together and thought, well, maybe we can reboot this old space probe and use it for science again, turn the science instruments back on and bring it back into orbit around the Earth with NASA's blessing. So this was sort of the sort of orbit that it went through and it would return to Earth around about 2014, this year. There was a bit of time pressure because although there, we thought there was still fuel on board, to actually bring it back into orbit around the Earth, you'd have to burn the thrusters, and there's only a limited amount of fuel, and so the closer you get, um, you know, you will have a limited amount of time and a limited amount of fuel to make that trajectory connect correction maneuver. If you wait too long, you won't have enough fuel and you won't be able to bring it back into orbit. So we sort of had this hard deadline. This is sort of over time, the amount of fuel that you would need to burn to make that same maneuver. Now, this space probe's out there, how do you talk to it? Well, Naturally, you use the biggest radio telescope on the planet. This is Arecibo, uh, the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico, because it's just got such an incredibly huge gain. Um, and just to give you a sense of scale there, that's the complete thing. And then these are my colleagues. Um, and it's just the scale of the place is, is just incredible. This is um, standing on, on the platform above the actual dish looking down. Um, a lot of the infrastructures housed in this thing called the dome, like their... Um, they're megawatt clastrons that are used for S-band radar work. Um, so long story short, we used GNU Radio open source um, implementation, uh, open source software to actually write a modem that NASA originally used to talk to the probe, but we created, recreated it because you know, NASA didn't have it anymore. So we looked at the documentation, put together this modem, hooked it up to the Arecibo radio telescope through the patch panel using these USRPs. And we managed to send a command to turn the telemetry back on. Because up till now, we've just seen a little carrier. And this is the really, really weak carrier here. Um, and then with a bit of pointing, you know, moving the dish around, searching the sky, we managed to make it a, a much stronger signal. Here we're sending the commands out, and I'm just using this B200 here to check that the commands are really going out into the sky, because th of course the radiation is going to go off the sides as well. I'm just picking it up here with the antenna. And then, sort of the moment of truth, That was when that unmodulated carrier suddenly became modulated with the telemetry from the space probe. So that was, a, that was a big milestone in the project. We turned them on for both transponders and you can see them 
um, being received there through the radio telescope, through the two USRPs. Um, and then um, the next step was to look at the propulsion system, send the commands up to fire the thrusters. Um, this is actually the telemetry at, a, at the slow 16 board rate. Um, and then we, you can increase the rate as your link looks better. 64 bits per second. You can see that it'll come up there. I know I'm running short on time, so I'll just... We usually just 512, that's what it sounds like. And it sends a repeating frame, so if you listen, there'll be this, this pattern to it. So this is a new radio, and I'll just finish up by showing you what the telemetry screen looks like. You can download the, the telemetry software from, from my GitHub. Unfortunately, the, the project has a sad ending, but um, we, we basically lost contact with it. Um, but just to look at the terms, these are the raw bits that are being decoded there. And then if you look at the subcoms, they tell you uh, sort of groupings of special bytes in that sequence. They group up over time. And then the, the actual information is extracted from that, like um, the status of the latch valves, the pressure in the tanks, the spacecraft clock, and they're listed here. So they're sort of the command counters and things like that. And then after that, you have the um, state of the, the propulsion system. So this is the propulsion system here. It tells you uh, basically what the state of it is, and we would send commands up to say, find this thruster that many times at this particular angle, and then we would check whether um, certain sensors that maybe detect the angle of the sun have changed appropriately. Um, and then you can go at 2K as well. So we tried to find the thrusters. This is the accelerometer values that come back. And unfortunately, we would have the first thrust and we got a good response from the accelerometer. And then after that, we got nothing. So we tried multiple times. All the different combination of thrusters on board didn't work out. What happened was, we presume, is that there was plenty of fuel on board. But nitrogen, which is a pressurant to push the fuel out of the tanks at the top down into the thrusters over the 30 years, somehow disappeared from the tanks. So try as we might, we couldn't, couldn't get it to work. So it's gone back out to orbit the sun. Um, Google made a nice website, Spacecraft for All, if you're interested in checking that out. Um, and that's the team. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you very much for listening. Mm -hmm.